That's just my first trick. How's everybody feeling this afternoon? How was lunch? Settling well? Good. Y'all meet some friends during free time? No. <laughs> that was the saddest like response. Did y'all have some good lunch? Yeah. Did you meet friends? No. Wow. <laughs> I'll be your friend, man. I got you. Thank you for coming to this session. I want to start I want to start with something important. I want you to leave here with an understanding of how the church approaches all people. And that is one way, which is with love. This is the fundamental reality of why the church exists. Jesus' mission and his whole life was directed towards love. The cross is a sign of God's love. And this is the foundation of everything we're going to talk about today. That's the first thing I, I want you to understand is that as I approach everything, it's rooted directly in that. Because everything we do is rooted in a God who in the first letter of St. John, says is love. The second is we know we're here to attend a workshop on same-sex attraction. And we're not talking though about a concept or an issue or something political. We're talking about people. We're talking about my friends and your friends. We're talking about brothers and sisters, moms and dads, aunts and uncles. This is not like, I hate it when people do that. I don't like it when people reduce it all to philosophy or concept or an idea or politics. Those things are all wrapped up, but at the core, there's people. And the foundation of the church's mission is love for all people. And so as we walk through this today, I want you to understand those two things. The third thing that's important for me as we kind of begin is that as we talk through this, I'm gonna use a lot of different terms interchangeably. So our church uses different ways of talking about groups of people, but the way in which they order the words always identifies the person first. When I worked in Wisconsin, we worked with children with autism, and you'll notice that I said that in a very specific way, because we never ever classify somebody by a medical condition. So you never would classify, you, I, I don't like to say autistic child, I say child with autism. Our church identifies the person first. So when our bishops speak about our brothers and sisters who are experiencing a same-sex attraction, they may say it that way. They may say people with a homosexual inclination. They may say people uh, who struggle with homosexuality. During this session, I may use the more common uh, terms, lesbian, bisexual, gay, transgender. And all of those things, as our bishops say, as far as language is important. But I want you to know that I'm doing that to identify the person first. And so let's begin there. Let's begin with people. And let's begin in prayer. Like I said, you're, you're not here because you were probably interested in like a course on philosophy. You're here because of a person. Maybe that person is you. Maybe that person is a close friend or a family member. And so as we pray, I want you to think of that person. And if it's you, to just offer up the prayer for yourself as we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God, you are love. You are love and you are light. You've created each one of us and you've created us your own. We are fearfully, we are wonderfully made. Lord, I pray that you bless each one of us here. That you affirm the dignity we have as children of God. That you whisper our worth. Lord, we lift up all of those who are wrestling, who are struggling. That person we're thinking of. 
We lift up all of those who have left the church because they've experienced hate or discrimination. All of those people who have left the church because they have a a distorted view of what the church has taught or they wrestle with it. Lord, I lift up anybody here who's ever felt that way. I lift up all of our brothers and sisters who have felt discriminated against, who have been the subject of hatred or anger or even violence. Lord, in a special way, we lift up the victims of the Orlando shooting, their families. We pray for healing in that community. We pray for a greater and deeper understanding and respect for all human life in our own hearts. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. So as we begin and we talk about people and the foundation of this is love, it's because God loves you because God created you. In the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis, there's this wonderful creation narrative. And God creates light and dark. He creates order out of chaos. He creates increasingly complex living creatures. And then the ultimate creation is humanity. God creates a man and a woman. And God says, I've created this man and this woman in my image and likeness. They have a special relationship with me. All of the other creatures that God created have tasks that they they do, and they go about the natural created order But this creation, men and women, have a unique ability to respond to God and to have a relationship. They have the ability to love and to be loved because they're formed in the image and likeness of the one who loves. And so each of us, every person here, is a child of God by the very fact that you were created in the image and likeness of God. When you look into a mirror, you see an icon of the living God, written in your very self. And sometimes that's hard because we may wrestle with different attributes of who we are. We may wrestle with how we look or how we feel on a given day. But the truth is, when you see yourself in a mirror, you see God staring back at you in a very unique and special way. And so as we begin, we say that every person created in the image and likeness of God is loved. And our church upholds and teaches this, especially when we talk about people who are marginalized, who are discriminated against, who are outcasts. Especially in recent years, the bishops have written a lot about people who are experiencing same-sex attraction, asking us and urging us to reach out with love. This is from a letter that the bishops actually wrote recently to parents of children who experience same-sex attraction. And I want you, as I read these words, I want you to think about the images in the media that sometimes we see attributed to the church. It's really hard in a world where news is boiled down to 140 characters, to a really clever Instagram shot, to a snap story that lasts maybe a minute. When it's all designed to catch our attention, what you see is the Westboro Baptist Church protesting the horrific massacre in Orlando, pouring fuel onto a fire of hatred which has already boiled over enough. And what you don't see are the priests that pray to the side, who work with the families, who sit down and speak compassion into something that is just so horrific. And so I want you to think of those images as you read this excerpt. All in all, it is essential to recall one basic truth. God loves every person as a unique individual. Sexual identity helps to define the unique persons we are, and one component of our sexual identity is sexual orientation. Thus, our total personhood is more encompassing than sexual orientation. Human beings see the appearance, but the Lord looks into the heart. Every person is created for a relationship with God, and every person is created unique. And for some of us, part of what we experience in our daily life is an attraction, a predominant attraction to a member of the same gender. The church, as it teaches about this, says that we don't quite understand the psychological genesis of that. 
which is different, again, than what we hear from some mainline Christian denominations, which is, well, no, that's actually not a thing. It doesn't exist. It diminishes the experience of men and women who walk that journey, who wrestle with that, to just, well, get over it. And the church doesn't say, just get over it. The church asks us to journey. The church wrote that letter to parents of young people who are experiencing same-sex attraction because it realizes that one of the main causes for homelessness for LBGT youth is when they come out to their parents and get kicked out. And so the church not wanting any Catholic family to resort to that, to feel like they have to do that, to be ripped apart by that, goes to parents and says, no, 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 no. The moment that happens, and maybe for you, you've experienced that. I was a youth minister for 10 years and I've walked with young people through that journey. Most recently, I walked with a young man named AJ, who I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. Through the journey, I just saw him a couple weeks ago and he's like, hey, could you pray for me? Like, I'm gonna talk to my dad and I'm gonna finally let him know my dad been experiencing same-sex attraction. I said, I'll pray for you. The church says, would you journey? with people, because the foundation of what we do is love. And if every person is created in the unique image and likeness of God, it means we can't reduce any single person to one aspect of who they are, like their sexual identity or sexual orientation. The church says you're more than just that. You're a child of God, because the thing is, my friends, and if you don't take anything else away from this, I'd urge you to take this away that who you are is not reduced to the school you go to, the clothes you wear, the person you date. It's not reduced to the mistakes you made or the accomplishments you have, and it's not reduced to your sexual identity. It will always be firmly rooted in who God is and who God has created you to be. Now, when we talk about these things, though, and we see what happens in our world and how we get branded, I'll be honest and authentic as I invite you to be through this. It's made me very nervous and anxious to get up here and speak to you. Because as a person, as a Catholic, my heart breaks when I see things like Orlando. My heart hurts when I've walked with teenagers who have said, my mom won't even look at me anymore. And I'm trying to live the church's teaching out. But like just the fact that I said I struggle with this, like she won't even talk to me. And so... I've wrestled with the tension of wanting to speak to you because I want to speak love into this and I want to speak truth into this because you deserve both those things and you deserve to know what the church teaches and why it teaches it. But I'm nervous because the way that the media would portray me right now is to take one sound bite out of context and say this bigot got up and just spewed his hate from a stage to a bunch of teenagers. And for you who are here, maybe that's a fear you have as well. I don't want to be labeled as someone who's hateful. I don't want to be labeled as a bigot. I don't want to be labeled as discriminatory. The church on this matter, in our our catechism, we have a large book, if you're unfamiliar, of all the church's teachings. And the church teaches about anything under the sun because it has a duty to do that, a duty to instruct us and a duty to guide us because the church loves us and wants us to experience freedom in Christ. And so all of these teachings can be found in a a pretty thick book called The Catechism of the Catholic Church. And I call attention to this particular aspect. Persons with a homosexual inclination must be accepted with every respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided with the utmost respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. The church vehemently opposes any sort of violence or hatred, injustice or indifference that's ever been shown to a person that's wrestling with same-sex attraction. And so, for, again, for some of you here, we're like, I know that you're sitting in this room and you're like, that's me right now. And maybe you're like wrestling with that. You don't quite know where to go. Maybe you're in a relationship. But I want to step that aside for a second and just say, like to take that on and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you've been the victim of that, especially from somebody within the church. I'm sorry if you went to confession that one time and and it wasn't a good experience, that instead of meeting mercy, maybe you met condemnation and have talked to people who have walked through that. And I'm sorry you had that experience where the humanity broke through the sacrament. 
the flawed humanity. I'm sorry if you went to a youth group and a youth minister got up and just read from the catechism and said a bunch of things and then said to just like knock it off, like stop being such a sinner. I'm sorry for all the times somebody said, love the sinner, hate the sin. But in your mind, you're like, I don't think you really believe that because I don't think you love me. I'm sorry for the times you felt like you couldn't walk through a church door. I'm sorry if you felt like you couldn't walk in here when you got here. And he said on Friday night, you belong, and you do belong. It breaks my heart to see people walk away from the greatest man I've ever known, Jesus Christ, because they thought he would look at them and say no. He says, welcome. Come. And this is the foundation of the church that I love. A church that sometimes has not been received in context and has sometimes been received with anger. But a church that speaks something contrary to what our culture teaches. And it actually begins far broader than just talking about same-sex attraction. Our church has and has always had a much different understanding of sex in general than the predominant world cultures have, even from the very inception of the church in Rome. Rome was a hedonistic culture where a lot of things went kind of similar to how we approach things sometimes in our own lives. Well, like if it doesn't hurt anybody. And so from its very inception, the church has taught something different, and it all goes back to that line in Genesis. Human beings reflect the image and likeness of God, and as men and women, we reflect the image and likeness of God in a unique way. You see, God, God is beyond our understanding of gender, of male and female. But when God creates men and women, each of them you reveal something unique, unique characteristics about who God is. That's why it's so critical that this line is in the creation narrative. And for those of you who are like, yeah, but my biology teacher said like everything, there was like a big bang theory and like, you know, people evolved. So like your Genesis thing is stupid. I, I understand that. Here's another truth bomb. The church teaches that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are what we call an allegory. They teach a deeper truth without needing to necessarily be 100% historically accurate. The Big Bang Theory was the theory proposed by a Catholic priest who understood this well. They teach us a truth about God, which makes this line even more important. God created us for love to reflect love, and we do that as men and women. God also created us, and when we look at ourselves, our bodies tell us something that we're designed to be given and to receive. And here's the truth that stands in contradiction to the culture. You were made to be a gift of self. You were made to give yourself to another. And the greatest good, the greatest love is self-sacrifice. There is no greater love than this, that one should lay down their life for one's friends. That's the greatest good. And that's what the church teaches and has taught. Underneath that good self-sacrifice, sex falls in there. But it's not the greatest good. And again, an apology is perhaps in order because some of you perhaps have attended men's and women's sessions or chastity talks where that has felt like the message. Sex is the greatest good. Get married so you can have sex. Let's all get married and have sex. I know that maybe they didn't say it like that. Because you'd probably been like, I actually don't want any part of this anymore. But maybe that was the message. And again, if you're sitting in here and you're like, yeah, but I can't get married, the church says I can't. That probably didn't resonate real well with you. So this is me saying, as someone who has a master's degree, as someone who has studied theology of the body, the greatest good that exists is self-sacrificial love and that it's lived out in one way as sex. But what the culture of today says is that sex is the greatest good. That if you're not having sex with somebody, you're actually experiencing a subpar relationship. And like, before you reject that statement, really think about it. We're very comfortable with divorce. And divorce is, is always a tragic situation. I know that many of us are coming from homes where our families have experienced divorce. But if somebody's not fulfilling my sexual needs anymore, sometimes that plays into divorce. Pornography is one major reason for divorce because my needs aren't being met by her, my needs aren't being met by him, and so 
I'll go elsewhere for it. Because if sex is the greatest good and your spouse stops giving it to you, I mean like, what? In your relationships, whether or not you feel like an extreme pressure to talk about it, when are we gonna take things to the next level? When are we gonna, when are we gonna really love each other? Because if sex is the greatest good, like, and you're not having it, doesn't that, like, what? And the same is true in what our culture says for, for individuals who experience same-sex attraction, that sex is the greatest good. And this is why the church teaches something different that we don't always get in the sound bites. Because the church doesn't teach that sex is the greatest good. Because, like, again, take a step back to think about it logically. If our church really taught that sex is the greatest good, the priesthood makes no sense at all. Like, actually, the priesthood would be the most horrific thing that you could do to a man. The religious life would be the worst thing you could do to a sister. Like, if the church was like, sex is the greatest good, but hey, come be a priest and be deprived. Like, it doesn't make any sense. But if self-sacrificial love is the greatest good, then the priesthood, then religious life, then marriage makes supreme sense. Because now even in marriage, like think about marriage and what we define marriage to be, which is the union between one man and one woman rooted in self-sacrificial love. Even then, sex is not the greatest good within marriage. It's one way that self-sacrificial love may be expressed, but it's not the only way. And you know this already if you've seen a couple in their 70s or 80s at each other's bedside as they're dying. And I don't, again, I don't mean to like sound crude, but like that couple's not thinking about having sex in that moment. The husband and wife aren't like, man, you're close to death. So. There's a new season of Kimmy Schmidt on Netflix, or like what? <laughs> and I make the joke to make the point. I want to break through that lie first. It's not. Because if it is, like, then life is really unfair. But let's just say that the church has a great understanding of that self-sacrificial love and how it all can start to maybe make a little bit more sense. Regardless of where you stand on how well you're agreeing with me or disagreeing with me right now, just come along on this, this argument just real briefly. In the book of Genesis, where we got that understanding that every person is created in the image and likeness of God and we're created with inherent dignity and that God loves us because we're his unique and special creation, it also says that God created us men and women, that God created them male and female, and that these two genders reflect who God is. And then he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So now there's a special commission given to them where the two genders in a special way through a sexual union can reflect God through a gift of self, through a gift of self-sacrifice. Our bodies are created with a purpose. I heard a great analogy recently where somebody held up a fork and they said, you know, if you look at this fork, what do you see? What's it used for and what's a fork used for? eating. It's not used for gardening. Like you could use it for gardening, but it just wouldn't be very effective. You could also use the, the fork for something bad, like, you know, stabbing somebody in the kneecap. <laughs> could you use a fork for that? Yeah. The same is true with our bodies. They're created for a purpose. And our bodies, what's written on them is that they're created for self-gift. And we realize that in one way, through an understanding that it takes a man and a woman to procreate, that through their sexual union, they reflect God in that moment in a unique way. God is a trinity of three persons, has a father, a son, and they generate a third person, the Holy Spirit. So when you look at a marriage, and this is why the Catholic Church calls it a sacrament, we understand marriage to be a way that that reality is reflected into the world, that the love of a husband and a wife have the potential to bring about a new human life, that they have the potential to bring about another person. Now, even if you don't get married, though, that truth is still written into our body, that we realize that there's a way that things kind of fit, that I'm not enough on my own, that there's a love that I can enter into. Sex, in its best form, should be self-sacrificial love. It should be a complete giving and receiving of two people 
and another that has an openness to life that can generate a third person. But we know that that's at its best. At its best, at its worst, it can be terrible, violent, awful things. But it's taking from this truth, if we're all created to be self-gift, to, to be self-sacrificial, this means that there's a higher love that we can elevate to, that there's other expressions of that love. And this is where there's hope within what our church teaches. If you're somebody who's wrestling with same-sex attraction, I would offer this to you. In my conversations with AJ, uh, as I've walked with him, he talked about having a conversation at a Steubenville conference where he realized that there was a different calling in his life. And it's tough because in a world where getting married and having sex and, and all of those things seem so glorified, he's, had to, he's chosen a different path, but not a different path. All of our paths are to holiness, and all of it involves self-sacrifice in some way. So he has chosen a life of service. I've asked him to write about his story and his entire testimony in a book called In Pursuit. There's a few copies left at the store, but you can buy it on Amazon Kindle. I would highly encourage you to read it. It's just his testimony. That's, that's all it is. And then in the back of the book, there's like a Q&A with questions right from the text. But I've been inspired by him as he's talked through and as we've walked through and as we've struggled through different moments where he talks about giving himself self-sacrificially, and finding good friends who he can walk with and journey with. The church saying to a person who identifies as lesbian, as gay, as bisexual, when they say you know, the, the sacrament of matrimony is for a man and a woman, it's not meant to say you're, not, you're no longer welcome in the church. You're not meant for holiness. You're not meant for love. The church encourages us and say we're all meant for love, and we all live that out in different, unique, and important ways. What you don't see is that there's whole communities of Catholics within the church who struggle with same-sex attraction, who live out very deep, rich friendships with one another, who live out chaste relationships with one another, who have realized that sex is not the greatest good, but there are greater goods, and they live them out. A great resource for you would be courage.net. It's that community. So if you're somebody who's wrestling and you're like, I don't believe that there's any other Catholic who's living out the church's teachings faithfully, which is to be chaste, to live a chaste life, which is to abstain from sexual intimacy. And to seek friendships where we live out love, where we live out companionship, where we sacrifice for the good of another. And this community says we can live that out faithfully, and we will, with the help of one another. So if you're somebody wrestling with that, I'd encourage you to go there. If you're a friend, of someone who's wrestling with homosexuality. I got a question a while ago from, from some, uh, a group of middle school guys. They're like, I think my friend's gay, what do I do? And I was like, be his friend. The worst thing you can do is look at someone and say like, my church like says like, no. <laughs> Cause that's not what our church says. What our church says is that you're necessary for one another's sanctity and growth and holiness, regardless of what your sexual orientation may be. But especially if your brothers and sisters are wrestling, it's critical that you say, I will walk with you, I will be your friend, I will stand by you, we're gonna grow in holiness together. And it doesn't necessarily mean immediately speaking truth and being like, but I need you to live out chaste, chastely, chaste, chaste life, chaste, chaste. Look it up then we can do this. Meet people where they are. The church absolutely believes in that because the foundation of the church is love. Our key scripture for this week is Christ proved his love for us that he died while we were yet sinners. Christ proves his love for us by coming for the ungodly when they were still ungodly. By coming for the sinful when they were still sinful. And that's every single person in this room. because you're worth too much to set aside. You're worth too much to not go after. You're worth too much to not journey for. And for some of you, maybe today you're like, I'm wrestling with this, but I wanna, I wanna live that life like AJ's living. I'm gonna pick up that book and I'm gonna do it. And maybe you struggle and you fall. And that's why we're a community, to pick each other up. Maybe for some of you, you're like, well, this actually kind of spurred something else on because I am, uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm not struggling with same-sex attraction, but I am having sex with my girlfriend or my boyfriend. Probably should knock that off. Yeah. And the church approaches you with love. It says, let's walk and let's journey. 
It is absolutely critical that we live these things out. Because right now in the world, the Christian church doesn't necessarily have the kind of teaching that the Catholic church does on this. We walk a very difficult middle way. Where we say to a person who says, look, I'm gay. Say, you know what? We're not, there's, there's studies about why maybe you have that inclination or that attraction. And we don't really care about them right now. We care about you. But in other places, that same person may go into a church and have someone say, well, that's not the case, so we need to figure out how to like, kind of fix that. The church offers paths if someone's interested in that but doesn't require it. It says, let me walk with you. Let's walk together towards holiness. Let me hear your story. Let me know who you are. Let me call you by your name, child, and nothing more.